Hi, my name is Arthur Waite, and this is my entry into the Microsoft Robotics at Home competition. The idea of my project was to create a robotic tripod that would allow amateur videographers to create how-to videos and demonstrations of projects that they're working on. There are tons of people out there these days who are making videos about their hobbies and uploading them to places like YouTube. And these videos span every possible category of interest, from gardening to carpentry to model rocketry, and to one of my favorites, cooking. Now, the challenge with a lot of these videos is that the star of the show is often also the camera person. And what this means is either they're holding the camera out in front of them and trying to follow themselves, or they've got it mounted statically on a tripod. And in either event, we end up losing out on the action because the image is improperly framed. So the smart tripod is really a autonomous cameraman who follows the star of the show around so that they don't have to worry about constantly repositioning and re-aiming the camera. Now, as you've probably guessed, I'm using the smart tripod right now to create this video. And you can see that as I move around my house, the camera is following me smoothly and, and in a fairly natural human way. But I figured the, uh, the real way to prove the usefulness of the smart tripod would be to create an actual how-to video and upload it to YouTube. So today I've been working on that. I've used the smart tripod to create a video of one of my favorite hobbies, which is cooking. Um, I've created a video on how to make this baked rigatoni, and um, I will upload it separately to YouTube. But in this video, I'm gonna show you first how the smart tripod is put together, how I built it, and so forth. And then I'll show you how I use the smart tripod to create my own how-to video. But first, let's take a look at the architecture and design of the smart tripod itself. And here it is. The mobile base is comprised, of course, of the Parallax Eddy, standard issue, and then I've added the laptop. And I've added an extra battery at the back, which powers the pan and tilt system up on top. The Eddy board does have power available, but the, uh, the servos can draw quite a bit of it and uh, could exceed Eddy's amperage rating, so I felt it was safest to provide separate, isolated power. Then I've got a lightweight commercial tripod secured to the mobile base. It can, of course, be raised or lowered as needed for a, for a given shot. And mounted on top is a custom-built tripod head with two decks. The bottom deck supports the Microsoft Connect, which is used for tracking the video subject. And on top, I've got the pan tilt system. And that's driven by a Fidget advanced servo board, which connects via USB to the laptop. And then it drives two standard high-tech servos, one for the pan system and one for the tilt. And you can see I'm using two gearing mechanisms from Servo City, which provide a 5 to 1 gear ratio from the servo to the, uh, the camera platform. And this allows for really fine-grained control of the camera and makes the movements really smooth and is a key to the success of the tripod. And then I've got a wireless microphone system, which just helps improve the quality of the audio a bit. So that's the hardware. Let's take a look at the software. So from an architecture point of view, this is a pretty standard design. We've got our inputs there on the left, primarily the connect skeleton data and the uh, WPF user interface, and our logic and hardware services there in the middle, which respond to the inputs, and then the outputs on the right, which are either instructions for the motors or the servos or the user interface. Now, I decided to break up the components into separate services and projects in Visual Studio because I wanted to be able to test them individually. So from the top to the bottom, I've got uh, there at the top a common library I just use for shared logic and data transfer types, uh, particularly a, a set of custom classes containing my calculated data about the tracked subject, uh, which is then shared by, by the other services. Then there's the mobile base service. This subscribes to the Connect and is responsible for creating the tracked subject objects, as well as coordinating with Eddie. And uh, this is really kind of the heart of the system, uh, where the, most of the heavy lifting is done. Below that, I've got the Pan Tilt service, which is responsible for driving the Pan Tilt system. It subscribes to both the mobile base and then a slightly modified version of the RDS Fidget service, uh, which is maintained by Trevor Taylor on CodePlex. I just added some smoothing support to the service. And then I've got some tests for the pan tilt, um, and there's that modified fidget service, and at the bottom, the user interface service. 
So this brings us to the user interface. This is built in uh, WPF, Windows Presentation Foundation, and uses the WPF adapter for R RDS. On the left side, we have the three main uh, smart tripod modes. Above there is an indicator showing the mode we're currently in. And the buttons allow the user to switch modes on the fly. And I'll talk more about the modes in a moment. Now we've also got a motion status indicator, which just tells us whether or not the wheels are actually rotating, and this is uh, read from the wheel encoders on the Eddy. Then there are a couple of power factor inputs, which I'll also uh, talk about in a moment. Then there's an input for setting the Kinect's tilt, handy to change depending on how high you have the tripod set. And then an active Q-zone status display, and I'll talk more about that in a moment as well. Then on the right, we have uh, at the top an e-stop button, which uh, frankly isn't particularly useful if your robot is running away from you, but it comes in handy when it's set up on a box during development and testing. And below we have the RGB frames from the Kinect, overlaid with the skeletal joints that we're currently tracking. And for this application, all we really care about are the subject's head, the center shoulder, elbows, and hands. We really aren't using anything else, so I, I don't bother displaying those. And then finally, we have the actual positions of the three key joints, the body, the left hand, and the right hand. And by body, I, I mean the center shoulder, although my code is designed to allow me to take the positions of several joints, such as the left, right, and center shoulders, throw out frames where there's an outlier or missing data, and then average the position of the remaining joints. And I can also take a weighted average of, say, the last 10 or 20 frames and use that too, which can help with smoothing. In practice, I found these techniques generally weren't necessary, but the, uh, the support is there if I want to harness it. And you'll see that the graphics on the UI are nice and big. And this is so that when the tripod is actually being used, the subject can see the state of the system from a distance. So let's go back and talk about the modes, because those really are the core of the smart tripod's functionality. And I'll use the cooking video I created to demonstrate how the modes work. So follow mode. This is pretty self-explanatory. The tripod will either move along in front of or behind the subject. And the subject can effectively steer the tripod by positioning his body to the left or the right. You saw me using this in the uh, introduction, and it's great for that new style walking narration or for moving from one area to another without interrupting the flow of the video. Now there's an algorithm here that affects the influence of x-axis position of the subject relative to the z-axis. And this is because the faster the robot goes, the more sensitive it becomes to horizontal inputs. And we can end up with an oscillating effect where the robot shimmies back and forth as it rolls along. So the algorithm ensures that when the subject is moving quickly, the x-axis influence is dampened. But when the subject is closer to the tripod and moving more slowly, the robot is more responsive to the x-axis input and it rotates well. And so that's where the two power factor inputs come into play on the user interface. These two fields are constants that are used by the algorithm to adjust that x-axis sensitivity. So in dolly mode, the tripod will emulate a traditional dolly used on a film set, where the camera would be mounted on a rolling track and move back and forth. So in this mode, we actually set up the top platform so it's parallel to the mobile base's wheels. We rotate it 90 degrees. And this way, the tripod moves from side to side to follow the subject horizontally. In my cooking video, I used the dolly mode frequently as I moved from the counter to the stove or to the kitchen table. And you can imagine that this would be good for situations where the subject is moving across a workshop or a classroom or for someone making, say, an exercise video. This would follow them as they move back and forth across their studio. In this mode, we're using the x-axis to control the mobile base, and both the pan and tilt servos are engaged on the tripod head to make sure we don't miss any of the action, and it works quite well. And finally, we have static mode. Here, the mobile base does not move at all, but the pan and tilt on the tripod head are engaged, and this is ideal for scenes where the subject is going to remain relatively stationary, but you still want the camera to follow him around. I use this several ways in the cooking video. First, I used it for shooting just basic head-on talking to the camera shots. The Kinect tracked my head and camera moved around gently and smoothly as I moved. The motion is subtle, but very human-like, and it really gives a sense that there's a person behind the camera and not a machine. Next, I used it for close-up shots. So when I was discussing the ingredients, I wanted to zoom in tight on them so that the viewer could see them. But in this case, I configured the pan and tilt to follow my left hand 
while I gestured with my right, and I was able to control the positioning of the camera with a pretty high degree of precision. This takes a few minutes of practice to get it to work right, but it really does work well and again gives a very human look to the camera work. Then another interesting feature which can be used really in any mode but works best in static mode is what I call the Q-Zone. A Q-Zone is a three-dimensional rectangle or cuboid in connect space. These can be defined anywhere and multiple zones can exist. And then we can program the Q-Zone to trigger an event when a particular joint or combination of joints enters the zone. So, for the cooking video, I defined a Q-Zone in the lower third of the screen, and then I programmed the pan-tilt system to track my head when my left hand was above or out of the Q-Zone, but track my right hand when my left hand entered the Q-Zone. And this works very well in snapping the camera from one position to another, for example, here I move my hand out of the cue zone to shift the camera from following my hand to following my head. And it helps to give the video a, a kind of conversational look. So a nice, uh, flexible way of using gestures to control the tripod. So that covers the operations available in the smart tripod, at least in version 1. Now in terms of uses for the robot, I think it could come in handy in a number of scenarios. Pretty much anywhere someone wants to conduct a demonstration or how-to video. I've used cooking as an example here, but the same functionality could be used for just about any kind of topic. I think it could be useful for online education, where instructors are using a whiteboard or demonstrating a science experiment, for example. School media rooms, where students shoot their own news videos and then broadcast them to the school on a daily basis. And really, anywhere a cameraman isn't available. And I think in some ways, the smart tripod may give you better results than an actual camera person would, depending on the skill of the person holding the camera. So what's next for the smart tripod? Well, first, I'd love to add another camera to the head of the tripod, one for wide shots and the other for more zoomed in shots. Each camera could be tracking different joints or responding to different cue zones, and this could certainly help speed up video production. Programmatic zoom control. Some cameras have a hardware interface which would allow the implementation of an RDS service for controlling the camera's start, stop, zoom, focus, and so forth. A small screen teleprompter could be useful. Again, the text output could be controlled via RDS to coordinate camera movements with the script. Audio cues. The tripod could respond to subtly worded commands in addition to the connect gestures. And then finally, live streaming. With some of the above enhancements, version 2 of the smart tripod could become almost a studio in a box and allow the user to serve up video in real time. So that's the smart tripod. I want to thank Microsoft and Parallax for inviting me to participate as a finalist in the Robotics at Home competition. I've had a great time working both with RDS and with Eddie. Um, a lot of fun, great platforms, um, and I certainly hope to continue to improve the smart tripod and expand on it uh, into the future. Uh, so thanks very much for the consideration, I do appreciate it, um, and now it's time to eat. <laughs>